so this is going to be a uh, a, a pretty mixed interactive lecture. For those of you who took the consequences course a month ago, you'll see some slides that you've seen before. Um, that's just going to be a review. I apologize for the redundancy, but just want to get you in the right in the right place to have the rest of the conversation. After that review, I'm going to go through, and I'm, I'm, I've got a, a different life sim model open up. It's not the Deming New Mexico model. It's a model that I built um, for a, a quantitative risk assessment that's got a, a fair amount of detail in it. And then we're going to do a little exercise with and, and have a, a very brief um, demo of a risk computation tool that Woody's actually the one of the leads on um, called Total Risk that kind of links back into all we've been doing this week in the name of kind of life loss consequence estimation. So I, I promised Woody I'd keep this to an hour or less. So we'll be done before before 2:45. Uh, it's it's not going to be terribly slide heavy, but we will have some probably a little bit of challenge with me not being there in person and and trying to hear you all. So I might need an a, an assist from from Stephanie again or something like that. All right. So. Stephanie did a really nice job yesterday talking to you in her uncertainty presentation about the different ways you can view uncertainty in your life loss results in LifeSim, right? So I'm going to have a little bit of that, and I'm going to kind of ask you to talk me through where I can find some information in this, in this lecture. And I'm also going to talk to you a little bit uh, in the lecture portion about how you can take all the information that's available to you in LifeSim and, and use it. Um, use it for greater good, if you will. So to, to get everyone thinking in terms of how results can be different, what sort of factors can influence life loss results, you, you know, what life loss results might be sensitive to, I'm going to go through a handful of slides. Like I said, if you took the consequences training, you'll see, you'll have seen some of them before. First, time effects of warning. Uh, because it's, it's a little difficult for me to hear, I'm just going to kind of walk through this. This is kind of funky. It, you know, looks kind of odd. Uh, if I were there, I'd ask you, you know, what about this looks odd? Life loss is, is lower in some cases for no warning. That, that's kind of interesting. Um, you saw why might life loss decrease at 6 a.m.? Probably what you could discern from this plot is that this is a, a residential area, right, where a lot of people are leaving and going to work during the day. So that's why, that's why you see life loss drop so significantly at 6 a.m. If no one leaves, those that do stay are still highly susceptible um, to losing their lives, which tells you that the flood characteristics are probably um, more lethal, so deeper, faster moving water. So this is, this is one way that you could portray results in LifeSim with a little extra work. Uh, time effects of warning. We looked at dot plots in, in workshop three. Stephanie went through them a little bit yesterday. <clears throat> Moving through a plot like this where you see the iteration density and how it tends to trend or how the scatter plot trends as you get closer to that time of breach. Life loss starts to increase pretty drastically. That tells us that there's a fairly, fairly that life loss is is fairly, fairly significantly impacted by our warning parameter or our warning issuance time. Looking at your structure data, you know, just taking a snapshot and looking at breakdown of 
of structure damage categories. You could do this using summary statistics rather than bringing that information out of LifeSim and building a histogram. You could look at something like this and say, hey, I'd expect life loss to be higher at night. Or it's possible that you have a fair amount of non-residential development right along the river where your flood characteristics are likely to be worse. And so, you know, this is this probably only tells part of the story. Looking at hydraulic characteristics, easy to look at depth grids. You could classify them and pull information like this out of LifeSim and get it, you know, you can view max depth and max velocity grids. You can generate summary hydraulics and present information about your flood characteristics in certain areas. This area, looking at how quickly that non-evacuation depth arrives, you would expect that life loss to be pretty sensitive to your warning issuance parameter here, right? There's a lot you can do with information that's in LifeSim or without even running the software itself and getting results that already starts to frame the narrative about direct life loss, right? <clears throat> and then once you have run LifeSim, right, there's a there's a plethora of different options you have for viewing results in ways that can help teach you stuff or, or help support you know, consequences narrative or risk assessments or improvements to, to local emergency management and response, right? If you're looking up here closer to the dam, I w we'd expect warning issuance time to be a key factor that impacts the potential for life loss, right? Moving further away from the dam, you'd probably expect it to be that protective action response rate. So what might you do to improve warning issuance? Maybe you put a siren on the dam, um, change your monitoring plan, have a, have a threat matrix that identifies early warning thresholds, maybe improving the number of communication channels that you have. Um, further downstream where Life loss is, is going to be driven certainly by the, the flood characteristics, but also by that protective action response rate. You might want to reconsider the messaging templates and, and have specific accommodations for people living further away from your, your dam, right? So it could be where we see this pocket of life loss several miles downstream of the dam, water's deeper, but <clears throat> For, li for life loss to be high like this, it means that either people had no time to evacuate or, or we would expect the evacuation rate to be relatively poor. Um, it, it could be a combination of both, but the latter is something we can improve with better messaging. So, so that's one, one way you can use that life sim output, right? Now, all right, I'm gonna give this a shot. I'm going to bring this life sim model in here, and I'm going to move it. Oops. Sorry, I'm going to end my slideshow for a second. All right. So using life sim in the context of different failure modes, if you're going through a risk assessment, particularly following best practices for dam safety, joint best practices from the Bureau and, and USACE, and you're, you're looking at a particular failure mode, there's a handful of specific considerations you'll have as a consequences specialist, uh, particularly with levees, the location of the breach or that potential failure mode is really important because the proximity to people and buildings can change quite a bit with length effects and levees. With dams, you know, the location of the breach along the dam isn't as critical as in the context of proximity to people or buildings. It's more about development in areas immediately downstream, right? Uh, flood characteristics, breach parameters, 
depending on the situation, breach parameters can have very little effect on life loss consequences or, or a fairly significant effect on life loss consequences. So thinking through your failure mode and potential breach timing and how quickly you'd expect water to arrive or what those flood characteristics like might look like in areas closer to the breach are, are important considerations. Talked a lot this week about warning and evacuation and evacuation potential. So all those input parameters that we use in LifeSim based on that warning and evacuation timeline you saw earlier this week, you know, for different failure modes, that ability to identify the, the threat or identify the failure mode or potential breach of your dam or levy earlier in the process earlier in the timeline or later, um, it, it certainly could change failure mode to failure mode. So it's important to consider the evacuation potential for different failure modes. And then considering the availability of, of egress routes, you know, certainly if you're simulating evacuation and trying to exact a life loss on roads estimate, you, you want to be thoughtful about how you build your road network and whether or not evacuation routes are gonna be available. All right, so now I'm gonna ask you um, a series of questions. And
we answered all these questions. Now I'm going to switch back to the presentation and talk to you a little bit about different ways you can use LifeSim. Um, these slides in particular are from a presentation we gave to a group of emergency managers to try to show them lessons learned from our consequences modeling effort and, and also how we used the elicitation information that they gave us, right? So this is a, this is a full extent animation. Um, you've seen animations a couple times in the last couple days. Woody showed you that cool one from Joso that showed people being warned at different times in those different warning zones. So this is just a full extent you see a whole bunch of cars moving and this doesn't tell you a whole lot it's it's i guess trippy to look at and you see a lot of a lot of people getting caught on roads people getting caught in structures as the flood wave propagates yellow means warned brown means no one's been warned although blue swarming is cars moving and then as the flood wave arrives if anyone hasn't left, they're stuck, caught in that structure, right? So you're looking at this and you're saying, all right, I can't learn a whole lot from this. But what you can do is hone in on areas that might be worth further inspection, right? What I would be looking at is an area like this or like this, where I see a lot of cars being caught and checking to see if that actually makes some sense. So I, I look here, and I know the hydraulic animation is a little behind, um, like Woody told you, depending on the time step in the hydraulic animation, there's there's some interpolation that happens in life sim. So you see cars starting to get stacked up right here at this bridge crossing. And there's a fair amount of life loss that happens in vehicles here. One thing I want to inspect first, you, you know, how high is that bridge and would I expect it to be overwashed? In, in this case, the answer is yes. Um, water gets deep enough that it overwashes that bridge quite early and it would cause this kind of backup. Now, one of the issues with that, so that, that made me take, you know, do some further looking. One of the issues with that is that, And this is something you can get from LifeSim with a little bit of work, figuring out the arrival time of water at any structure, the arrival time at two feet of depth. So you generate summary hydraulics, and then you can classify that, that point shape file to show when water arrives at different structures. I look at this area and I see that there's really only two major primary egress routes for this neighborhood, right? You can either get down, head to the south on one or two roads, or you can head to the north across that bridge. And there's several thousand people living here. So this tells me, and I communicated this to the emergency management group, this, this, this area is prime for an early warning. You've got a second reservoir down here. So it, this area is flanked by the second reservoir. There's very few roads that head out of this neighborhood and water arrives in less than four hours for about half of this neighborhood for this particular event. So that, that would be fairly concerning for, for an emergency manager, right? And, and as it should be. So this, this, group, this area here, people are gonna need more time to evacuate and pulling these plots out of life stem, showing arrival time of floodwaters can be, help provide a really compelling case when when you do have the opportunity to work with emergency managers. Like I said earlier this week, you know, for us in the core, you know, I, the, we get to interact with emergency managers and share information like this from work we've done pretty infrequently. It's, I think, one of the coolest things or, or capabilities those of you working in the private sector have is that you can go out and, and sell this as a, as a resource. You can say that, it, you know, you can really meaningfully impact emergency management practices downstream of, of flood defense structures in our country that will ultimately help 
change the likelihood of someone getting exposed to highly lethal floods, and, and that's a powerful thing. The same token, you can come up with arrival times for structures. You can do the same thing with roads. That You can see that bridge crossing kind of right in here. You can see that that gets overtopped inside in less under four hours after breach occurs, right? So there's very little time of that warning goes out at the time of breach or close to the time of breach for people to evacuate heading north. Um, I think it's a worthwhile road closure at some point during the course of an event. Now you'd say with limited egress routes, would you really want to close the road? Generally, no, but, and, and so you'd, you'd keep it open for as long as it's safe for people to head north and then away from the flooding and heading west. But once you get closer to that bridge overtopping, having people come this way only puts them at greater risk, right? So as that messaging should include, hey, head south. Um, and that should be the messaging early as well. So there's a lot you can do with LifeSim results, right? And I'm really just scratching the surface. Uh, and, and that's as far as we can get this week. Uh, I showed you evacuation outflow earlier. This stuff can be really helpful with evacuation planning and also troubleshooting and, and making sure that your results make sense. I sing, I signaled that, singled out this, this particular freeway, Woodall Rogers Freeway. I see that in the course of a handful of hours, we go from very little traffic to 5,000 vehicles an hour, right? So. I want to know if, if that particular roadway has the carrying capacity for that type of an evacuation. And that's the type of thing that can help support evacuation planning, right? A lot of states have good information about average annual daily traffic counts. Life Sims evacuation outflows showed about 7,400 vehicles leaving along this freeway with a peak outflow of 1,000 vehicles an hour. Given the average annual daily traffic count, even if you account for the one way, <clears throat> um, for the directional components of the road, this is well within the flow capacity of that road. So we wouldn't expect there to be any major hangups here. And it's possible that you could even route more folks along this road. So this is the type of information you could get from LifeSim to help support evacuation planning. I always, I really like the, the heat maps in LifeSim. I, I think they tell a powerful story. We used to use dot plots a lot, and dot plots showed life loss estimates in structures. Uh, you still can do that in LifeSim if you want to show mean life loss results in structures. <clears throat> and that, <clears throat> that can be nice for situations where a handful of structures are really driving your life loss estimates, but the heat maps provide concentrations, so they show you neighborhoods or, um, you know, industrial parks or whatever like that that are significantly contributing to that life loss component. This is another thing I shared with emergency managers. It shows, you know, population at risk, and then I show a concentration of exposed population at risk. So where are these concentrations of people that are getting exposed to the flooding <clears throat> for this particular event? One thing that's kind of nice to do is if you've gone through the elicitation process, you can show something like this. You can also then carry it forward and show people um, how much that median exposed population at risk estimate would change if they were to incorporate those potential opportunities for improvement in their emergency management practice, right? So you've gone through the elicitation process, you look at the scoring sheet, like I was showing you earlier this week, you're seeing identifying areas where um, they scored poorly. If they were to add improvements, you could show a change, you know, the estimated difference in that exposed PAR estimate. And that can, that can be pretty powerful. If you're showing 150,000, but if they incorporated improvements, your best estimate from LifeSim is 25,000. That's, that's 
125,000 people that aren't exposed to flooding because of improvements to emergency management practice, right, or emergency action planning. That's, that's really compelling. And those are generally low-cost actions relative to, uh, you, you know, building a levee or improving a dam, right? We already talked, to, we've, we've gone over box and whisker plots quite a bit. Um, these, are, these are really helpful for decision makers because they show kind of the, the full range of potential outcomes given your uncertainty about your input parameters. And if you've gone through the elicitation process and spent additional time with your structured data set, gone through the effort of simulating evacuation and done really as much as you can to reduce the uncertainty about your input parameters, these plots can be really telling. I talked earlier about looking at your different road segments. Another map output you can get from LifeSim is, is you can see the different road segments that have higher life loss estimates or show life loss on them. These these green ones, those are kind of fingers and toes, right? Those are situations where maybe one, two iterations out of a thousand are showing life loss on the roads. So the mean life loss estimate's quite low. And then you've got these road segments where life loss on those roads is actually quite high. And those are situations where generally it's worth a little forensic analysis to make sure that that makes sense. Um, and that's a really nice nice map output from LifeSim as well. So what the maps do, right, is, is they help you confirm your results and confirm that your results make sense. And they also provide really powerful visuals when you're taking that output from LifeSim and making the case towards decision makers about risk associated with, with a dam or a levy, right? Okay, we've got about 20 minutes left. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how we take life loss or, or economic damage estimates from LifeSim and make them work in the context of, of risk management. So you've seen this graphic a couple times this week. This is our, our risk-informed framework for infrastructure. We're talking about Life loss consequences we're talking about, and, and risk, we're talking about an estimate of life risk, right? Life risk is, is the likelihood of loading on a dam or a levee, and then the likelihood of poor performance given that loading times life loss consequences, right? So it, it, it all comes back to risk. And you, you always want to get to a risk estimate, right? Because saying, presenting either probability or consequences on their own can be misleading and leave out really important elements of the story, right? Um, there are challenges sometimes in the broader levy safety community, kind of the national levy safety community, because there's, there's some pushback on sharing risk information with the public. Levy, levy owners want to be able to say, hey, my levy's in great shape, and that's what we should be communicating. Because they, you know, local stakeholders have an incentive to build tax revenue, and they want businesses to come in. So they don't want us to share information about risk, um, us being the collective us in, in levy safety nationally, not just the Corps of Engineers. But that, that's not telling the whole picture, right? You can have a levy that's in really great shape, but if it were to fail, it could cause really high life loss consequences. A good example of that's New Orleans. We've spent a lot of money improving those levies in New Orleans, and the likelihood of those levies failing is, is quite low. Those are, those are robust flood risk management structures, but if they failed, you know, New Orleans is, is below sea level. There's a lot of water that could flood a large area rather quickly. 
the, the potential consequences are, are dire, right? So that's why it's so important to, to present things in the context of risk. LifeSim is explicitly a consequences tool. We get, we get questions all the time, um, internally as well. How does LifeSim estimate risk? How does LifeSim, you know, deal with, you know, different hazard curves or system response curves, everything like that? We're not doing that in LifeSim. In LifeSim, we're, we're taking events and coming up with getting down into the weeds to come up with defendable life loss consequence estimates, right? But then we need to take those and do something with it. And that's where the risk computation comes in. So what I'd like to do here, and then I'm going to do a, a little demo, is we're looking at this table, this output table. I took this from a recent dam breach analysis that a, that a colleague did. And these are the life loss estimates they came up with in their model. This is a pretty standard dam breach analysis, a dam breach consequence modeling effort. Five different pools. You can see range of 100 feet between kind of the more frequent pool and the probable maximum flood pool. And then you can see life loss increases as the reservoir elevation increases, which you'd expect. If you were trying to come up with a risk estimate, how would you take this information and convert it into a consequences function that you could sample in a risk calculation? First, I'll start, I'm, I'm going to start, so, so be thinking about that. I'm going to start with a couple of, of easy questions uh, or thought-provoking questions, hopefully. Would you use daytime or nighttime life loss estimates for your risk computation? Daytime. Okay, why? Because they're higher. Because they're higher. Okay. So we're looking at looking at this and saying, all right, my daytime life loss estimates are higher, generally higher. So I want to make sure that I'm representing the highest possible life loss estimate. I don't want to be leaving life loss on the table, so to speak. So I'm going to choose the time of day where life loss estimates are the highest. Okay, H how might you combine the daytime and nighttime life loss estimates so you had a single estimate? Average Stephanie, if that's you, I'm, I, I can't hear you. Average them. Average them? Okay. Average them. So, so I would say you could do a, a, a form of averaging them, and that's weight, coming up with a weighted average. And what what we like to do is use exposure weighting. So you saw the, the population interpolation in LifeSim or, or that, that population interpolation schematic uh, earlier today. And you could use something like that to say, okay, people are, people are away from their home for 14 hours a day and they're in their home for about 10 hours a day, Let, let's call it, you know, 55, 45, and we'll say, we'll, we'll weight the daytime estimates 
0.55 and the nighttime estimates 0.45 and then we'll we'll add them together to come up with an exposure weighted life loss estimate right that's one way that you could take daytime and nighttime life loss output or any consequences output right and combine it so that it's representative of all 24 hours all right if you were going to develop a consequences function and let's let's say it's a consequences curve because we want to be sampling a consequences curve along with our our hazard curve so that annual exceedance probability estimate of flooding for any given stage. We're going to use stage rather than flow so we don't have to deal with transfer, transforming flow to stage. But so we, you, you saw the framework earlier, hazard, performance, consequences. So we're going to have functions for hazard and performance. How would you build a consequences function from this data? How would you build a consequences curve? Cool. Say that again, Stephanie. If you associate the probability that's associated with each pole elevation. Yeah, so we've got stage over here, right? And so we're going to have a probability associated with each pool. And that's going to be our hazard function. And then we're going to have a probability of poor performance for each one of those probabilities of loading. And that's going to be our estimate of performance risk or our system response function. And then we need to have a consequences function. So that risk estimate, like you're talking about, yeah, we would have a probability associated with each pool. And that, that probability times the probability of poor performance for that particular pool times the consequence would be a life would give us a risk estimate right so I could come up with different ways to build a consequences curve right we've only got about 10 minutes left in the hour so I'm gonna I'm gonna talk you through this a little bit you could build a deterministic curve if you wanted and just use Stephanie suggested daytime results. Just use daytime results and use the median median estimates for daytime and create a curve that way. I'd much rather acknowledge the uncertainty uncertainty in my estimates. And you can see I'm missing my outliers, right? I'm I'm showing estimates with 90% confidence. So I'm not showing my, my maximum estimates or my minimum estimates. Rather, I'm showing, uh, you know, this six number summary with 90% confidence bounds. I'd probably look at this and want to build either a triangle, a consequences function using a triangular uncertainty distribution or, or a PERT distribution which is similar to a triangular distribution. It just places more, more weight on the most likely outcome, right? So there's, there's different risk programs out there. I'm going to show you how I took it and used it. This, is, this program is called Total Risk. If you've got questions about Total Risk, Woody's in the room, and he is a great resource. He, he built it. Um, so, I've got my hazard function, right? I just built this really basic hazard function. It's the same reservoir pools that you saw for the, that consequences table. Then I went and I built this system response function, just super basic. And that's got this response associated with it, also linked to those same pool elevations. And then I've got this tabular consequences function. So what I did is I took the the nighttime population and I took the minimum, the median, or, or excuse me, the fifth percentile, the median, and the 95th percentile outcome for each one of these pools. And I built this consequences function, which I brought into total risk. So now I'm able to set up a risk analysis 
where I'm using deterministic hazard function, that system response function, and that consequences function with the information I just had on the slide. And I can run a risk diagnostic. And that's going to tell me that my life risk plots here. Now, if I want to know what that means, incremental risk, or this is my expected annual life loss estimate right here, 1.38. So that's my annualized life loss estimate. If any of you are familiar with expected annual damages or, or the Hydrologic Engineering Center's FDA program, um, estimating expected annual damages has been used for a long time using the Riemann's, the Riemann sums calculation. Expected annual life loss is a very similar calculation, but it's a reflection of life loss consequences rather than economic damages, right? Another pretty cool feature in total risk is that I can actually pull life sim output by mapping to a particular life sim model. Uh, I like this quite a bit. It's one of the many functions that Woody and Hayden have added that, uh, is it going to let me do it? Let's see. Yep, there we go. So I do that. I add it to my window here. And I go to edit it. If I want to add a row, add probability associated with it. And then you can select from your simulation and have different life loss estimates for your various events. And it'll build a consequences function for you. There we go. I've only got two estimates in that particular one, but it looks like that. But kind of a cool feature in a risk calculation program. Total risk's in beta right now, but when we go through and when we make all this effort to estimate life loss, there's a lot of forensic analysis we can do within LifeSim itself. There's a lot we can do to pull results out of LifeSim and use them to tell a story for decision makers or for emergency, the emergency management community. And then where the rubber really hits the road is, is taking those results and using them to inform risk estimates. And those risk estimates help us understand what's driving risk for any flood risk management infrastructure and helps inform how we can make decisions about how best to reduce that risk, right? 